Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this first Center for Theoretical Physics colloquium after the rather lengthy holiday break. And it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our speaker for today, uh, Professor Alexander Bursche from Archaeology Department of the University of Warsaw. And uh, uh, Alec is my dear friend and uh, collaborator at the Center for, uh, at the Copernicus Science Center in Warsaw. We are, uh, so to say, the founding fathers of that institution. And uh, uh, Without Oleg's like, contribution to that endeavor, it will not uh, be as it is now. Uh, Oleg is an uh, archaeologist and he is also busy with the coins, old coins, with the new Madden. And I had always difficulty how that should be pronounced in English, so I think I skip it. He is also a uh, head of the institution uh, is as far as i understand it's a polish chapter of the uh, international and institution or organization of a representative of a humanities who attempt to show that this branch of a science can also undergo the digital revolution as many other branches of science have undergo uh, Alec is, has got many awards and uh, contributed a lot to the also, not only to the science, but also to the uh, popularization of archaeology. He is one of the fathers of the um, uh, many exhibition, archaeological exhibition, traveling and uh, the Buddhist uh, uh, reconstruction. Biskupin. Biskupin, I'm sorry. Biskupin reconstruction. Uh, but uh, we will do the Buddhist reconstruction also, isn't it? And, uh, and um, he is going to talk to us today about the, are there any real discoveries in contemporary humanities? Uh, Professor Bursha, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Lukas, for kind uh, introduction. Uh, also, thank you for uh, invitation to the colloquium. Uh, first of all, best wishes in New Year. And uh, I wish you that uh, we all can finally meet in person in a relative short time. Uh, my uh, contribution will generally concern archaeology and uh, numismatics, the, the most digitized disciplines of humanities. The use of new technologies has led Polish archaeologists to wonderful discoveries. Uh, in the introduction, I give you just two examples. The first one, uh, done 10 years ago, uh, concerns the pre-Columbian Vari civilization existing about 1,200, uh, 12, uh, 1,000 years ago in Castillo de Hurme in Peru. Polish team uh, from our university uh, was directed then by uh, Professor Miłosz Gears, here you can see in the classical Indiana Jones head, and on the right side with a brush in his hand. So the, the stereotype, uh, uh, the old stereotype of the archaeological work. By the way, I've got uh, the original head of the Indiana Jones, which I uh, I've bought in the National Geographic Society in New York during the exhibition Indiana Jones and the Reality, one of the best uh, exhibition I ever seen, presenting the many uh, sites from the movie Indiana Jones, uh, uh, which were actually archaeological sites, and uh, uh, the researchers were sponsored there by the uh, National Geographic Society. Well, but coming back to the, uh, uh, this uh, 
uh, this uh, Polish team, uh, they have used the uh, girl radar uh, as uh, so ground penetrating radar, which is one of the, well, since 20 years, a method of non invasive archaeological uh, prospection method, and uh, discovered uh, the first undisturbed rural tomb of the Vari Empire, containing remains of uh, 58 noble women, six human sacrifices, two mutilated guardians, and over 1,300 artifacts made of gold, silver, bronze, decorated pottery, as well as rare wood, bone, and so on. And this discovery was considered by the National Geographic Society and the Archaeological Institute of America as one of the most important archaeological findings worldwide. Two years ago, there was an exhibition uh, of uh, this uh, fantastic discovery uh, in the uh, Warsaw Museum of uh, Ethnographic, Ethnographic Museum. So perhaps some of you have a possibility to see this results uh, of this research. Well, the second example of important discoveries is not so impressive and concerns the time of formation of Białowieża forest. In recent years, due to the action of politicians, so last five years politician, the protection of this natural forest has become an important element of social discourse. Among other things, the argument was made that the Białowieża forest has existed since ancient times, for many thousand years. However, pollen analyzers noted high anthro anthropogenic indicators for the first half of the first millennium AD. So on the right side down, uh, in this first 500, you can see really a high number of different pollen uh, which are supposed to be connected with the presence of uh, uh, well human settlements yeah and then later in during migration period early uh, early medieval period it much less of them but the natural forest start to grow sorry uh, that is more detailed and more recent uh, diagram made for one of my projects concerning migration period and you can see again down this very strong uh, uh, number and some of uh, anthropogenic indicators and again uh, uh, starting from the 6th 7th century then uh, uh, these territories were covered uh, uh, by uh, the forest so uh, in the first four centuries AD, uh, they dominated pastures and farmland, uh, the existence of which we knew nothing about until the application of LIDAR. So the slide detection and ranging uh, using the laser pulses. And LIDAR has registered there many linear structures, the entire networks of fields and farms based on the archaeological research settled in the first half of the first millennium AD by Germanic societies, the, the groups of the gods, first of all. Uh, that is the very unique findings on the continent known only from the British Isles as so-called Celtic fields. The important conclusion is that the Białowieża forest was formed at the earliest in the migration period or early Middle Ages, around 6th or early 7th century AD. Many other fantastic discoveries have been made over the past decade with the LIDAR technology, including around 500 previously unknown new Mesoamerican sites built by the Maya and the Olmec uh, civilization in Mexico. So that is the sum of example, or that's the findings from the recent 10 years. 
So most of my archaeological colleagues from the perspective of our discipline, I mean archaeology, uh, do not share the view about the alleged crisis, crisis of the humanities. Well, in my contribution, I would like to tell you about the results of research of my team related to non-ismatic, so coin uh, research, in the frames of the IMAGMA project uh, uh, of the Beethoven program in cooperation with the German Archaeological Institute created by National Science Center and Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. By the way, German Archaeological Institute is a branch of a Ministry of Foreign Affairs and very well financed. Their politicians believe that the German archaeology is an excellent promotion of the country abroad. It is a pity that Polish, Polish politicians do not think so, do not agree with them. Uh, IMAGMA is an acronym uh, from uh, Imaginus Majestatis, so the Latin uh, words, uh, and the full title of the project was Barbarian Coins, Elite Identities and the Birth of Europe. And acronym IMAGMA intentionally refers to the name Enigma. My partner from the German side was a British scholar in origin, David Wick. So that was in fact a bit Polish-English cooperation. Uh, for five years, uh, we've been solving puzzles of uh, the imitation of imperial coins in the Barbaricum and at the same time roots of the Germanic coinage. In the monumental series, medieval European coinage uh, published in Cambridge, in the first volume concerning early Middle Age, so uh, second half of the first millennium, uh, Phil Gerson and Mark Blackburn, uh, famous economic historians and numismatists, have written following. The Germanic peoples, in contrast to Celts, beyond the frontiers of the Greek and Roman world in the last centuries BC, had no coinage of their own prior to the invasion to of the empire. I would like to prove today uh, uh, that uh, they were wrong. But let me start with some general introduction and remarks. We are now in the first half of the first millennium AD, uh, when our part of the world has been divided into the Roman Empire and the territory of the barbarians, so the barbaricum territory outside of the uh, Roman Empire frontiers, so currently so Central and the Eastern Europe. I will start our story from the middle of the third century, the crisis of the empire and the barbarian invasions. Numer gold and silver items appeared in the East Central European finds from that period. That is the example of the uh, so-called mm, uh, uh, chieftain grave, uh, uh, G Germanic grave from the Slovakia, uh, of the gold, different gold items, and uh, all including uh, uh, gold, uh, full gold bracelet, uh, uh, which is a kind of the uh, symbol of the power usually found on the right hand uh, uh, of uh, the uh, of the chieftain. Uh, well. Uh, however, there were no gold or silver ore deposits uh, of strategic, of the important significance that were explored in the antiquity in Central Eastern Europe. So, where is the precious metal from? That is a very interesting discovery of Roman gold coins dated to the mid first century, cut in pieces, which has been found in spring 1941 during construction of a military, so Luftwaffe airfields outside the village of Stara Wieś in Podlasie uh, in Eastern Poland, when Germans started preparation for the offensive against Soviet Russia. The practice of bending, breaking, and cutting objects into fragments is well known in the Barbaricum areas. This was how the Germanic warriors dealt with the spoils of war. The discarded Staravish hoard was the starting point uh, for my findings. 
So the star of Yish, it's the number eight here, just about uh, 80 kilometers north uh, east from Warsaw. Uh, it turned out that uh, from the territories of Poland and the West Ukraine, settled at this period by the gods, Gothic societies. The, about gods, you probably hear as a Visigoths uh, from Spain or Ostrogoth from Italy in the early medieval period, but they are the same gods in the earlier period. So uh, and this territory uh, comes with a huge number of gold coins from the middle of the third century. That is Imperial Decius, uh, Emperor Decius coin, uh, which ruled uh, just in the mid of the third century. Uh, and this uh, Emperor Decius ruled for maximum 22 months. Uh, so you can see it's more than 50% of our ray uh, from uh, Central Eastern European finds dated to this very short period. According to written sources, during this period, we had uh, to deal uh, with mass invasion of Germanic war bands under the leadership of gods on the territory of the lower Danubian provinces, firstly to the Dra Dacia, uh, so Sarmiza Gatuza, current Transylvania, and then the lower Danube Balkan provinces. Uh, gods occupied and captured many Balkan cities, including the Marcianopolis uh, and Filipopolis, uh, current Plovdiv, taking many valuable loots. Emperor Decius tried to prevent them from returning to their homes in 251, but suffered a severe defeat in the Battle of Abri Abritus, just on the Danube River, and himself and his son died on the battlefield. This is the first time a Roman emperor has been killed by barbarians. I came to the conclusion that the imperial treasury, so in Latin, erarium, must have fallen into the hands of the Gothic warbands, probably containing many tons of precious metal, primary gold in form of coins. Well, this is a safe in German panzer castle in form of chest from Pompeii that could hold several tons of gold. Chemical analysis uh, confirmed that gold in barbaricum was of Roman origin. Well, I have published my discovery eight years ago in the Nunismatic Chronicle and recited as a first foreigner, uh, excluding British scholars, the Gillian Prize awarded once every five years by the Royal Nunismatic Society for the greatest discovery in the field of ancient Nunismatics. It is already widely accepted by historians and nonismaticians. However, a, a new question arises: for what purposes did barbarians use Roman gold coins? In my paper, I have suggested that gold coins with a portrait of defeated emperor were prestige objects used by elites in the first place by military leaders. Presumably, they were offered as a reward to warriors for merit in battle. I added that this opinion would probably never be proven. And here I was wrong. Practically at the same time, Jana Gruszkova made a wonderful discovery in the Austrian National Library in Vienna. A palimpsest uh, currently known as a Scythica Vindobonensia. The palimpsest is a manuscript piece of writing material on which later writing has been superimposed on a faced earlier writing. So here, this earlier writing you can find in blue color. Uh, she identified uh, Gruszkova it with unknown fragments of the Scythica of Dexippus of Athens. In this way, historian gains a completely new, invaluable account of the Gothic incursion into the Balkan provinces around the year 250, handed down, and it is crucial by a contemporary, I mean, Dexippus of Athens, who lives during this period. 
Using state-of-the-art technologies, the four-year Skitica Vindobonensia project implemented by the Austrian Academy of Science helped decipher, publish, and interpret successive fragments of this text. Among the published fragments is a remarkable passage marginal to the narrative, which refers to the way coin was used in the Germanic environment, and more specifically in the relationship between the rule, King Kniva, King of Gods, and his Gothic war bands. This is the first ancient text to offer some insight into the role of coinage among the barbarians of the Northeast. According to this account, during the siege of Filippopolis, so the Plovdiv in Bulgaria, Khan Bulgaria, King Kniva was persuaded by one of the refugees from the lower city to make a direct attack. He sent five men on the nighttime reconnaissance, men who had volunteered, tempted by a reward in coin. In this context, we find the following fragment, which I read in translation. As a prize, the king offered 500 darics to the first man who climbed the walls, and to the second, 300, and to the third after him, here is Lacuna, and to the rest, similarly. In the present case, we have a unique description of how my, uh, coin may have been distributed within a single group made of the Gothic warriors, so warband, as a part of the relationship between the the chieftain, the rule, and his retinues uh, in Latin, this, this war band uh, uh, has a name, Comitatus. So it has this coin, this has been used as a form of payment. The National Ossolinsky Institute in Wrocław has in its collection a gold coin of Roman usurper Postumus, so reigning in 70s of the third century, with a fascinating Greek graffito, vi goinoi in genitivus, genitivus. So it means that this coin has been owned by Gotios. Uh, considering that uh, the Ossolinsky collection was originally formed uh, in Lviv, Lvov, uh, uh, what is now Ukraine, the arrows must be found from that region. The name sketch on this coin is probably Gunzias, a Gothic chieftain of the Germanic auxiliary troops in Legio Decima Fretensis, uh, presumably the owner of this arrows. Regardless of whether this very likely identification is correct, we have here a name of Roman uh, on a Roman gold coin inscribed in Greek alphabet of the Gothic owner of this coin, most probably chief of war band fighting for usurper Postumus. However, the main subject of the Magma project research was the coins made by the barbarians. The basic, the basic question was, how the barbarians, most of all Germanic elites, mastered the mint technology. I'm presenting here point by point uh, one of my most interact, uh, interesting intellectual adventure, which I have published for the first time five years ago uh, in 216. I begin with this very mysterious gold pierced coin that has been kept in the collection of Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris since the end of the 19th century. The obverse uh, on the left side has a portrait of the Emperor Gallienus, who ruled in the 60s of the third century. Uh, but there is a very strange legend around, composed not the Latin letters, but of very strange characters. The reverse legend indicates that it was striking with the die of Alexandria Troas, a, a Roman colony located in Troas in Asia Minor, current Western Tarka. So, Colonia Augusta Troadensis, Alexandria Troadensis is written here. Uh, so, that is the current Western Tarka, close to the former Troia. Uh, the biggest problem, however, is that 
in Asia Minor, this period no gold coins were minted, but only bronze coins, such as in presented uh, in this slide. Well, Ernst Babelon, publishing this coin, and also Jean-Andrien Blanchet, the mo most famous numismatician of that period, uh, have completely no idea what it could be. The other similar coin appeared at the Gornent Mosch auction in the Munich uh, in 203, also without reasonable explanation of its origin. Many coins uh, from Central East European metal detector finds are unfortunately often sold at this auction in Munich. Finally, in 2014, at the Ukrainian Internet Forum Biology, created by metal detector users, another similar coin has appeared. It has been found in a small village, Liniv, in Volhynia, in northern Ukraine, territory since mid third century settled by gods, by Gothic societies. Well, as soon as I got the information about this discovery, the hard disk in my brain was activated. And when it was already red hot, a green light turned on. I will present this story very briefly. According to uh, written sources, in late 50s and early 60s, barbarian war bands leading by gods invaded many Roman provinces, included Asia Minor. Historian Jordanus, here is the text in Latin, mentioned that during one of the rites, they cited numerous lewd, uh, spolia, prede spolia potiti, uh, destroying the Alexandria, Toros, and the Ilion. So, Troia, that's Alexandria, Troia, and Ilion, it is former Troy. This invasion probably took place in AD 262. Archaeological research confirms numerous damages dating back to this period. So the Alexandriatos had been excava excavated uh, uh, for a long period by the German collector Minster. Uh, then on the right side you have uh, go physical results of the research of the and reconstruction of the plan and the buildings uh, in the Alexandria Troas. Uh, several uh, coin holes with the latest galleons uh, pieces were also found. And the Jordanus uh, a bit later mentions that after that invasion, the gods return to their homeland, homeland, that is in the western Ukraine. Accent the ergo at propria sedes regressi, so came back to the homeland. Well, I have carried out a comparative analysis of dice, and I have stated beyond my no doubt that the gold coins were struck with the same dice as the bronze coins. So this obverse of the bronze coin is struck with the same die as this gold one. This bronze on the right is struck with the same as the on the left side. And with the reverse, it's the same so many, Bronze coin of the Alexandria Troas uh, uh, struck with the same as the one on the uh, here, this one, gold one. So, what is the conclusion of these facts? The Gothic war bands sacking Alexandria, sacking Alexandria Troas, cites its colonial mint and probably abducted its employers, so minters. Back uh, in their homeland in western Ukraine, they began, uh, began minting gold pieces using Roman dyes for colonial bronzes, perhaps aided by the abducted mint workers. That was another important discovery, the first proven case of a mint plunder in antiquity, and at the same time the way in the, which the know-how was transferred for the Roman Empire into Barbaricum. In recent years, information about new similar coins has been coming, all of the provenance from metal detector finds from the western, uh, northwestern Ukraine. 
However, let's come back to our first coin from the collection in Paris. The same Ouvre dice has been used to strike this coin as the bronze one on the left, on the right. So this bronze coin and this gold one, looking on the portrait, has been struck with the same die. It is even possible to see original Latin legend, so imp licin gallienus, like here, well, under this uh, very strange uh, characters. The Latin letters on original die have been re-engraved by barbarian illiterate. That is the very early stage of coin imitating. So that is the other uh, uh, coin striking with the gold coin striking with the dice for the bronze coin from the uh, Alexandria Troas. And that is the later stage of the imitation. So you can see further stages with evident process of barbarization. A good uh, example found in the village currently Balam Balamutivka. Well, I very much like this old Slavonic name. It was Polish Bałamutowka. Uh, in the barbarian uh, territory, the Roman myth technology continued to evolve. Gothic craftsmen learned, among other things, to cast in a mold coin flams, so that is the, the round uh, coin blanks, yeah? uh, or to make their own dice. So here is the mold for casting coin flanks, so this blanks found in the Grubek in southeastern Poland, so central place dated to the 3rd, 4th century occupied by, by Gothic civilization. And uh, there is a group of Gothic coins belonging to one workshop uh, from Ukraine. The reverse, however, has no prototype between Roman coins. It is a pure barbarian craftsman invention. So you can see on uh, different pieces uh, uh, it, um, done with the same die, uh, this uh, very strange horseman. Uh, and the same with the reverse on the right side of the coin in the form of the flower. There is no Roman prototype. And uh, here, uh, the other one, with the obverse legend on the left side, written in the runic alphabet. Lurctitis uh, fragmentary, probably a name of the Germanic owner of the coin. Well, uh, Gothic minters have done also cast copies of the Roman denarii and silver coins. So uh, that is the bronze mold found in Simoni, also in uh, Volinia in northwest Ukraine. And it's a, pro a possible prototype uh, down, uh, the, the silver original uh, coin uh, or, or original denar of the Roman Empire. And here I'll present you a simple animation of the casting, yeah? how this uh, coin has been cast. And here are remains of a workshop for cast copies from Abrashivka, well, in the Khmelnytsky district, and the distribution map of a such workshop, which is similar, practically, to the finds of this uh, gold coin struck with the Alexandria uh, Troas die. Uh, striking technologies used by Gothic minters were quite advanced. They used piece punches, transfer dice, cubing, and coin planting. Uh, here, uh, I will explain it uh, in a few sentences. Uh, here is an interesting example of a silver coin. So the legend, Latin legend, is of Hadrian, but the portrait is of Antoninus Pius. How it could happen? Now look carefully, please. Firstly, these coin, two coins on the left and down have identical bust done by the same die. 
but they have a different legend on the right side. And the other two, quite opposite. They've got completely identical legend, yeah, done with the same pair of dies, uh, but completely different portrait. Looks very strange, don't you think so? That is the result of hubing using transfer dies and piece punches. Now a bit about the technology. There is no doubt that it was possible to copy dice mechanically in antiquity. Uh, while it is possible to hammer a coin into a heat softened die blank, it was probably more usual to cast a bronze hoop and make a transfer die. And now to brief animation to explain. So how to make a bronze transfer die. I hope from this animation you can understand it. So let the clay dry and pure in the bronze. And uh, that is how the cube, which could be hammer in dime blank to make transfer die has been done. And now how to make a transfer die, just hammer the cube into the future die. And now you have a transfer die. Uh, so hubing all such hubes uh, had major shortcomings. The images are often incomplete and off-center. Wither and defects on the coin are copied. The edge of the coin used often shows up on the die. There was little economic interest for a regular Roman mint because ancient mints used very few dies, and dies did not take long to make, if uh, you know the technology. And uh, this is the barbarian mutation made with transfer dies, uh, just that obvious Hadrian coin was made by first casting a bronze hube, then striking a transfer die, then recutting the letters in the negative on the die, and then barbarian craftsman who made this couldn't write. His legend is nonsense. If you look on the legend, so the portrait is in touch, but uh, the letters are reworked by the elitere. And uh, the reverse of the same coin has been done, made by first casting a bronze hube, uh, then recutting the feature of Salus and the letters in the positive on the hube, then striking and transfer die. So uh, the attributes of the Salus, the feature of Salus, has been cut away, and all the letters are uh, written by illiterate. So on the left is the Roman denarius of salus type before recutting. And the snake and sister and the ruder down, so, and the glob were all cut away. And in the result, you have uh, the, this uh, imitation on the top right. Well, and here is a cut piece of uh, coin used as a piece punch found in Kmielnicki district. This piece punch on the uh, down have been used to project the reverse of the coin fine from the bottle. And uh, again, there is an example of cube found in Jarmolnici, still Kmielnicki district, and uh, coin uh, striking with the use of that cube. So this Patrick, this cube helped to strike this uh, two coins on the bottom. Well, and uh, that is the distribution map of barbarian gold coins with two main groups. So the earlier Eastern European, so you can see here the main concentration and uh, later on the Danubian group. This gold pieces uh, began to be striking in the second half of the third century and continue in the Hungary plain uh, uh, in the fourth century. Firstly, in Western Ukraine, territory settled by Gothic societies. Uh, what were the reasons for the manufacture and post 
acceptable function. Most uh, gold barbarian coins are pierced or more rarely have a loop added above the head of the emperor, similar to the Roman gold found in Barbaricum. The insufficient supply of original array from the territory of the empire had in the first century, uh, late in the first century, was the main reason to make imitation for Gothic societies. At first, gold coins were used primarily to display affiliation with the Gothic elite war bands, so military elites, as military decoration, insignia of rank awarded by the ruling group, as we know it from the uh, from this palimpsest, Vienna palimpsest. Later, they could take on a different meaning, fulfill an apotropaic function, and so on, generally used as a payment. Germanic communities, both those that remain in the Barbaricum and those that immigrated to the South and West, continued the tradition of imitating coins, developing it into two different directions. So first one, prestigious to the North, and the second one, economic to the West and third. So prestigious development to the North, so then Gothic communities migrating from Ukraine back to the South and Scandinavia in the fourth and mid five century carried to the North customs and technologies of imitating Roman coins and medallions. And uh, well, the final sorry, evolutionary stage of this phenomenon are native Scandinavian bracta. So here you have fourth century imitation of coins and medals, that's one from Norway, then uniface one sonnet medallion uh, from Sweden, and then one-sided gold bracteats. This one already with the uh, runic uh, inscription in runic alphabet and present, presenting an Odin on horse. Uh, the second uh, Western uh, and South direction is connected with uh, prestigious and more economical development. So Gothic groups migrating from Ruk Ukraine uh, in the early migration period to the Middle Danube and farther South and West brought with them their know-how, their technological skills from coin production. Uh, in the great Hungarian plain, uh, solidi of a Constantinian uh, dynasty, so for a century the period, are imitated. So here you can see some example, still mainly for prestigious purposes. While the first identified Germanic mean, concretely Gepid mean, striking mainly gold and silver coin, was established in Syrium. Sirmium is currently Sremska Mitrovica in Serbian. And later, in late 5th, uh, early 6th century, that is the later uh, stage of development, and appear the mostly Germanic, the solidi coins uh, of the Germanic kingdoms uh, on the former territory of the Western Empire. That is the distribution map of the barbarian silver coins with one main concentration in the Western Ukraine, uh, but spread over the entire continental Barbaricum and the Baltic island. They were produced in Western Ukraine, territory settled by Gothic societies in the second half of the first century until mid five century. Besides uh, the greatest concentration in the Ukraine, we get the smaller concentrations in the Hungarian plain, central Poland, western Germany, and the Baltic islands. They were very often striking with the same dice in the same Ukrainian workshop. So it is a network of the silver coins uh, uh, in the late Roman period, early immigrations of third, five centuries over the entire central eastern Europe. Uh, 
silver and silver plated uh, barbarian coins were usually not pierced. Uh, so have na no holes. They were used together with Roman denarii as special pauper's money. First of all, as a storage of wealth and means of payment in the prestige economy of barbarian elites until the migration period, that is the sixth century AD. That is again silver coins from the Sirmium, the first uh, located now in mint uh, uh, from the late five, fifth century. At the end, uh, I repeat once more. Until the research presented here, it was widely accepted that the Germanic communities introduced their own coins only in the early Middle Ages, settling on the ruins of the Western Roman Empire at the end of the 5th and the 6th centuries. Once again, Philip Grierson and Mark Blackburn has written, the Germanic peoples, in contrast to the Celts beyond the frontiers of the Greek and Roman worlds, in the last centuries BC, had no kindness of their own pure to their invasion to the empire. However, I am quite sure that my both late friends, knowing material presented here, it's relatively new material, would agree that the Germanic communities, in particular the Goths in the East, had an extensive coinage system from the late 4th century, both in terms of metrology and iconography. Well, this title of this uh, monumental volume perhaps uh, should be a little bit changed and start not in the 5th, but in the 3rd century AD. So the most important conclusion and main discovery of in magma project is the roots of the early Germanic coins are almost two centuries older than we used to think, dating back to the mid third century AD. Well, I am not sure how much I convinced you that real discoveries in humanities are still being made. However, I can assure you that the research presented here was a fantastic intellectual adventure for me and the whole eMagma team. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So I'm Professor Truski, are you here? Maybe he lost the connection because I do not see him on the list. Therefore, I will be now a, a chairman. So hello. 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 Uh, I don't know. I mean, I my camera is not functioning properly. Can you hear me? Now, yes. yes. Okay, so uh, let's thank the speaker. And uh, everyone is muted. <laughs> and because I am not visible, can you take over with the question session? Yes, so I would like to thank again for this uh, presentation. For me, it was very interesting. And, uh, yes, I, and uh, mostly very clear, uh, especially uh, concerning these nice conclusions. But still, we have time for questions. And uh, yeah, yes, of course, all questions are welcome. <laughs> So I see uh, there were some comments, but I also see the raised hand of uh, Wojtek Helving, please. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Thank you very much Not for a very, problem, but, yeah. very fascinating lecture. I just might need to say personally that history was, was my favorite subject in the in the elementary school and second favorite after physics in the in the high school. So so it was very entertaining as well. I have a, a bit of controversial question. So uh, we know that present days the, the uh, public space is sometimes, sometimes filled up with the pseudoscience kind of a, 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 a nonsense. And usually in physics, we have a quite good uh, way to deal with that because obviously, you know, if someone states uh, nature works like that, but nature doesn't work like that, it's quite easy to manifest. Of course, it gets more complicated once you uh, consider small things like quantum or very large things like universe. 
But I wonder how you can deal, and have you encountered this problem in archaeology and how you can deal with that? I'm, I'm, I'm suspecting that you have encountered that because I personally have seen some crazy theories about, you know, uh, ancient path, uh, past of, of uh, Europe and, for example, the origin of Slav and things like that. So could you comment a little bit on that, how you can deal with that in, in your field? Well, of course, though, that there, are, um, there are some of uh, the subjects uh, which are uh, very controversial. And uh, I think, as, as you mentioned at the end, this, uh, uh, well, origin of the Slavs. And, uh, well, uh, I can say particularly in recent time when I, I published result of the, our other project concerning with the migration period uh, using, uh, so, uh, again, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, with, with the use of, of uh, many uh, interdisciplinary work, uh, well, including pollen analyzers, chemical, and so on. And we pr really proved that uh, we cannot uh, uh, speak about the uh, Slavic settlement between before, uh, well, migration period or practically before 7th, 8th centuries AD, uh, then start a very a very great discussion, of course, about it uh, uh, from different uh, position, and it was in the social media and so on. I mean, uh, well, uh, uh, the, the, our archaeological possibilities, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, well, to... Uh, it's relatively quite strong, I can say. There's something uh, already in the introduction has uh, uh, mentioned Łukasz uh, Turski. So, I mean, uh, because of the uh, organizing this uh, archaeological festivals in Biskup, in many other places, and because of uh, many impressive, uh, 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 I mean, exhibition presenting our recent discoveries, uh, I think... Uh, uh, and we archaeologists and the archaeology as a whole, it's not only in Poland, in the, the, the most part of the world, has got uh, a wide acceptance in the society. So perhaps it's possible to say that, uh, well, we are uh, kind of the, uh, well, uh, uh, we are not the typical uh, humanities uh, uh, was the classical humanities uh, like like literature or or, or philosophy, but uh, uh, thanks to this kind of the uh, old time and recent discoveries, uh, this improvement of of the society is relatively high. I'm not sure I, I correctly uh, answered to your question. No, no, I think I got the right impression and I definitely agree that I think that the archaeology that is, is the evidence-based science close to as possible to evidence-based, which in humanities, other humanities like history have problems because they have to interpret the sources and stuff like that. So it's, it's really amazing to see that it's become such an interdisciplinary science and congratulations again on your discoveries. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have many raised hands, and uh, the first person in the list is uh, Professor Lech Mankiewicz, please. Lech? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the very interesting talk. I just want to comment about 12 years ago, I think, or maybe 11 years ago, we were as Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, uh, we took part in a uh, project, uh, the social science project, uh, organized by the Oxford Papyri society it was uh, about uh, i'm not sure i can pronounce it properly oxyrhynchus uh, uh, papyri project and the idea was to ask uh, internauts to decipher uh, uh, ancient papyri uh, found and uh, uh, subsequently uh, transported to uh, england and stored there for about uh, 100 years and uh, that was very interesting to see how the, so to speak, internet and uh, so, uh, the, the topic is uh, called uh, citizen science can meet uh, archaeology as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
thank you. Uh, may I have a short comment to that? Uh, well, uh, my uh, Oxford College, uh, my Oxford colleagues from Wolfson College. So they they they've got a fantastic uh, project uh, uh, connecting with the. Uh, uh, very interesting discovery in very center of the London city. Yeah, well, they found uh, 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 wooden tablets, uh, uh, well, partly written uh, with uh, many first uh, economical uh, so transactions, uh, which is dated to the mid first century AD. So the London city existed as the economical center already in the early Roman period, in the mid first century, uh, thanks to, we know it, thanks to this, uh, this interesting discovery. It's very difficult to read uh, uh, this handwriting of these uh, wooden tablets, and uh, uh, that is the seaford using also most recent uh, technologies of fluorescence and so on. There. Thank you. So now, Professor Łukasz Turski. Uh, I, I have a strange question. The gods have come from the East. And what you are talking was what was happening on the Western border. And all those coins um, were manufactured, well, in broadly speaking, today's Europe. But what was happening on the eastern border? Did they have any interaction with the eastern civilization? After all, the China was there, India was there. Did those people also have their own coins? And how was there any, any influx of a technology or any interaction technologically with the eastern gods or, or they were separated from the, for the, from the Far East? Well, it's uh, <laughs> well, very good question. I thought it could be a subject of the the other whole <laughs> uh, the other cool, full paper, yeah. Uh, but uh, well, uh, that is the the reason is uh, for this intensive production here. So that is a creation of the Gothic early Gothic kingdom under. Hermanaricus in the fourth century, we know it from written sources. And that's so this territory of the uh, practically mostly Western, but partly also Eastern Ukraine up to Kharkiv uh, in the until fourth century has been occupied by these Germanic tribes. Outside it, uh, to, the, uh, to the north, for instance, uh, on the Baltic Sea, we've got this uh, West Balt and Balt societies, and they do not have coinage, they own coinage until the medieval period, even in the uh, 11th, 12th century, they do not use any kind of the coins. They, we've got they only uh, some of the findings as the imports. Yeah? And then the same, when you look uh, more to the east, I mean, uh, clo closer east, up to the uh, Caucasian and uh, uh, Caucasian mountains. So then we've got uh, the Alanic, so the Sarmatian groups. And the uh, Sarmatians are well also uh, uh, well on the other stage of the development, and they practically do not need and don't use, do not use any kind of the coins. And uh, well, they, we find them some, a few of them in the in the graves. But coming back to the Father East, well. Uh, I do not think that there is any kind of the direct connection with this uh, territory and the India or, or China. But at the, at the other hand, as the result of the connection, that is mostly a connection with the India, direct connection with the Roman Empire and the India, and a lot of uh, direct connection, a lot of the Roman coins found in India, we do have the same uh, situation there. The India, the societies in the India start to copy, to imitate the Roman gold and silver coins and slowly uh, introducing them, uh, their own iconography and ec iconology. So uh, the, the same process began uh, in the completely independent region. 
Well, and and the China is a, a, a very different subject. There, yeah. there is, of course, some connection, but uh, well, in the rather later period. Yeah. So, but that has a very deep. Very, very few. But we, we, we do, uh, uh, in, the, in the frames of the project, we are in strong cooperation. Uh, Professor Bożena Czernet Mikołaj, so uh, Bożena, please. Uh, I, I think there are suggestions that uh, migration period is actually connected with uh, climate changes. But do you think that those earlier wars are already uh, in, in 250 and the rearrangement in the Gothic societies are also somehow uh, already related to the change of, of uh, climate conditions or it's just political and let's say random process? Well, yes, of course. Uh, the, the, uh, well, the, some of the uh, origin process of the migration of the people from from this uh, the territory of the uh, well Central East Europe uh, that is the climate change. Yeah, in the we know about this uh, this uh, changes particularly in the mid fifth uh, early sixth century. So, uh, uh, well, uh, they are both. Uh, elements so from one side the the climate change from the second part the population of this territory is uh, the result of the uh, what you can see in the pollen profiles in the pollen analysis of the growing uh, uh, elements of the forest zone and it is uh, uh, almost all of the pollen analysis from from the territory of the central North Europe, we have a few from the south part, uh, show us that uh, this there is no uh, human indicators, uh, any plants connected with the human activity, but uh, they are dominated by the by the forest. So they are these two two elements which are which are important for this 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 changes in uh, natural changes in this this territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank so, you. I propose now the last question of uh, Mikołaj Kozinski. Mikołaj, please. Hello, good morning. Uh, I have a question regarding the gold and silver of, 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 this coin, of these coins. I, I suspect that the refining technology was not very, very advanced at the times. And in that case, I guess you could, in principle, locate where exactly the metal has been uh, mined. Is, is, is it possible? Well, uh, we uh, we cooperated in the frames of the project uh, with the, uh, the two teams. Uh, the one is our uh, chemical department at our university, and the other one is the the, the German uh, from uh, the uh, uh, one uh, connected with one of the important uh, uh, mine museums. Well, and they are the, they're the quite advanced in this. Uh, uh, well, different uh, technology of uh, of analysis of the gold and silver, and saying true, it is not so easy because it's a usually uh, a process of uh, remelting down different kind of gold and different kind of the silver. There are some exclusion, and the one is uh, uh, that uh, in some of the this uh, barbarian coins we noted. Uh, something what is not uh, uh, recorded on any uh, Roman gold. That is the, uh, this uh, metal, uh, I mean, Ruthenian and the other uh, very uh, high weighted uh, metals, uh, 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 which are, you can observe it as a small inclusion uh, within uh, gold particularly, because they have a very uh, high uh, temperature. You cannot melt it in down in the normal temperature, so they are small inclusion. Mm -hmm. And this kind of the ores, you can have only in the Autai and the uh, Caucasus mountains. Mm -hmm. So they rather couldn't be connected with the Roman Empire. They could connect it be with this, uh, well, let's say, all the Sarmatian groups from the territory of the uh, Western Asia. 
So, so that is one of such example. But uh, rather, it is difficult to connect it with the concrete mine because of this uh, several time of the remelting down of the of the yeah, metal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So now maybe the last question because Professor Kioski was also raising his hand. So, Professor. My question is not so important, but I may still ask it. Be, uh, so your conclusion is that those uh, Germanic people learned uh, make coins from Romans, uh, but uh, 200 years before, as it was uh, believed before, but Romans, they learned from whom? From Greeks or from um, uh, uh, other people like Etruscan or, and uh, final question, who was the first? <laughs> well, well, uh, of course, it's a uh, traditional question in the numismatics, but uh, we, uh, if you think about the first of the first, they are probably uh, late Phoenicians and very, very early Greek uh, of the Asia Minor. Yeah, so that we know the, the first, uh, if we speak about the coins, real coins, not the, uh, well, the coinage is a different kind of the possible metal. So it is very early, very late seven, early sixth century on the territory of the, well, the Asia Minor, so that is when it's the connected with the with the early stage of Greeks. So that is the the first. I mean, I talk about the our civilization. It's a different in China. Yeah, so that's a, that's a different situation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Once more. Goodbye. We enjoyed.